those of you who are here. And for the rest of you, we're glad that you can see us. <laughs> we're glad that you decided to join in to be a part of this. Picture on the screen, the woman is Geraldine LaMancha. And she contacted the church. <clears throat> she's been in the area about a year. Her husband died about a year ago. And she's been in the area and has been monitoring the, the, our, not just watching, she's been joining in the Zoom services for quite some time. She has a history with the Church of Christ, but she has been thinking or rethinking some things recently, decided she wanted to be baptized. Mm -hmm. So I met with her this afternoon and talked for her a little while, and I guess the picture is almost self-explanatory, isn't it, there? We, we probably won't see her often. She'll be seeing us, I think, probably every time, but we'll be seeing her often. She has an autoimmune disease, and she's very reluctant to get in crowds with other people, although it may very well be that Sometime during the period of her medication, maybe after she, immediately after she had the treatment, she'll be able to come be with us. So I encourage her. I said, if we can find some way to isolate you so you can come be a part of us. Very nice lady. You, you would enjoy meeting her, and she would definitely enjoy meeting all of you. Amen. 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 So, um, what else am I supposed to say? Silence your phones. And... I guess those who are watching probably already know this, but the broadcast on, on the evenings is on OABS, not Zoom. You can't Zoom in and participate, but you can watch us. Remember those on the prayer list. And I will tell you, more and more I hear about people. As our children grow older, we think, what do we pray for our children? And several years ago, I decided to pray for my sons. Lord, protect them. Things that would discourage them spiritually. And I think in our life and times that there are more and more things out there that can discourage people spiritually. So if you like those words, let me encourage you to pray those for all of us. For all of us. Uh, pray for those on the prayer list. Pray for those who might be influenced by the hurricane. And I'm beginning to think, I, Carol and I might be two of those. I have a gospel meeting, Lord willing, we're supposed to leave Thursday morning for South Carolina, and depending on the track of it goes, we may be one of those affected by the hurricane. Uh, I think that's all I have, except I think I'm supposed to introduce the speaker for the evening. You know, you can know too much about somebody but you always want to be careful if you're introducing somebody, because if you're introducing them, that means they speak next. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, John. John, I especially appreciate. Maybe I've had more opportunities to appreciate him. Well, I kind of figured it out slowly. He figured it out much more quickly. It's hard to get into China. But the Chinese people are scattered. They're scattered in Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, a lot of different places. Australia. Everywhere. So you don't have to travel to China to teach the Chinese. And John, who spent 10 years in Taiwan and learned the Mandarin language fluently, he has been helping us fulfill that role for many, many years. He's been doing it in Georgia with his work, and now he's decided to come here and brought his wife with him, and they're going to live among us. His daughter is up in Southwest School of Bible Studies. But I don't know. I, I, the bio that I have has, has what, 30, uh, what, 75 mission trips, but it's this what's upcoming is number 80, right? Going to preach the gospel. So we appreciate John. We're glad to have him with us because of his good work, and we're glad to have him with us as part of this congregation. So that concludes that. And now, as we begin our service together, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the many blessings that we have in this life. We're grateful for the many things that give us courage, the things that encourage us. And we do indeed pray for your protection from those things that would discourage us spiritually. Yes, Lord. We pray that you will be with this congregation. May we increasingly accept the responsibility of spreading the gospel in this area. May we increasingly be willing to put forth the effort that that takes. Yes. We're grateful for this series of meetings from Brother John. We're grateful for the clarity and the accuracy with which he preaches the word. 
We're glad to have him for this series of meetings, glad for those who have been joining with us in various ways, and pray that will indeed be a part of our outreach to this community. Forgive us of our sins, renew us in our determination to know your word, renew us in our courage to do only your will. Forgive us for those times we do not, for this is our prayer through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to mark in your songbooks number 226, that's our invitation song after our lesson for this evening. Number 226. In our song before the lesson, The Church's One Foundation, number 517. I led this uh, on Sunday, but um, by special request, I'll lead it again. And uh, this does follow the tune of Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, so don't get the, the lyrics mixed. The Church's One Foundation. Hmm. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation, by water and the word. From him he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood. Not with wisdom of words, 
lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And so in this passage, Paul talks about us being of the same mind and the same judgment, and that there be no divisions among you. In 2022, that's this year, by the way, there are about 40,000 different churches in the United States. Now, when I was growing up, I bought a book called Handbook of Denominations by Frank Mead. I think it was Frank Mead. It's the first name. And there were about 300 denominations that existed in that particular time. But then later on, something happened. What happened? People did not like the churches they were in, so they started their own. Back in 1987, uh, I read an article in USA Today. Do they still publish USA Today? I don't, I don't know if they do or not. Anyway, there used to be a newspaper called USA Today. And the Episcopalian church was trying to decide back in those days if they would allow women to be priests or pastors in the churches. And they voted it down at that time. And so USA Today interviewed one of the ladies who wanted to be a priest or pastor in the Episcopalian church. And they asked her, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to start my own church. And then she said in the interview, if you do not like the church you're in, start your own. <laughs> and since 1987, that's what people have been doing. If they didn't like the church they were in, they started their own. So we go from 300 different religious groups in the United States to more than 40,000 today. 50 years ago, when we talked about New Testament Christianity, we would say non-denominational or undenominational. But today, denominations use these same terms to point out that they are not any particular denomination. And so the title for our lesson is the phrase that Brother Charles White came up with a number of years ago. Brother White has passed away uh, in recent years. Uh, Brother White uh, coined this phrase, as far as I know, pre-denominationalism. That is, the church that existed before any denomination existed. So in our lesson tonight, we're talking about the pre-denominational church and some of the characteristics involved in denominationalism. Number one, denominationalism is wrong and sinful. Why? Why is it wrong and sinful? Because the New Testament teaches that there is but one church. Now, we talked about this on Sunday morning during worship when we talked about the way of salvation. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus promised to build one church. In Acts 2 and verse 47, the Bible says, uh, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should or who were being saved. Then in Acts 20 and verse 28, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd, shepherd what? The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Paul says in Ephesians 4 and verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling. He, earlier in the book, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul says that he put all things under his feet, that is, the feet of Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so these passages of Scripture that we just looked at points out that Christ promised to build one church. That church was built and began on the first Pentecost after Jesus rose from the dead as recorded in Acts chapter 2. Paul tells us 
that there is only one body, Ephesians 4 and verse 4, and in 1, 22 and 23 he says that body is the church. And so these passages emphasize the, that Jesus promised to build one church only. Now we didn't even talk about John 17, 20 through 22 where Jesus prayed for unity. He wants his followers to be united. And one of the reasons that he wants his followers to be united is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. What is one of the reasons that people reject New Testament Christianity in the 21st century? They look around at all of the different religious groups that exist, all claiming to be part of the church that Jesus built, part of it, or the only one, and they say, look, they can't even be united. Why should I be interested in being part of that effort? So it has kept people from obeying the gospel. And so Jesus wanted everybody to be united in him. Well, further, denominationalism is wrong and sinful because the church is a body. It is the body of Christ. Romans 12, 4 and 5, we have many members in one body. Colossians 1, 8, 1, 18 is another passage that points out that he is the head of the body, the church. Also, Ephesians 4, 4 that we've looked at already, there is one body. Further, the church is a bride, that is, the bride of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 32, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul talks about the special relationship that existed, that exists between Christ and the church. And he uses the marriage relationship to talk about that special relationship. And then in Ephesians 5 and verse 32, Paul concludes, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The New Testament knows nothing of a multiplicity of churches with different doctrines. If you went up to a Christian in the first century, and you, you asked him, what church, what church are you a member of? He'd say, well, I'm, I'm a member of the church that Jesus promised to build, and that he built beginning on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in, in our, our Bible today, as recorded in Acts 2. He would have simply said, I'm a member of the church that began on that first Pentecost after Jesus rose from the dead. He would have not known of any other churches that existed because they did not exist at that time. The New Testament knows nothing of a multiplicity of churches with different doctrines. Because the New Testament teaches that religious divisions are wrong, as we've already noted in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, denominationalism is wrong and sinful. We've already read this passage, so we'll not read it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, but we will read the next verse, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Note what Paul says here to the church at Corinth. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For even for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? This denominationalism, division, is in direct contrast with the Lord's Prayer. We've already talked about this from John 17, verses 20 and 21. Know what he says. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me 
through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Denominationalism retards the salvation of lost souls. Again, John 17, 20, 21. That the world may believe that you sent me. Well, because of the division that exists in the religious world, people do not accept the gospel. Now, you may hear this sometimes. You may hear someone said, I examined Christianity and I reject it. But you know, they never really examined New Testament Christianity. What did they examine? They examined denominationalism. And they saw all the divisions and the inconsistencies and the contradictions that existed between those religious groups that are in existence and what the Bible teaches. And so they would look and say, well, here's what the Bible teaches, but here is what this particular group practices. And they say, they say to themselves, that is representative of New Testament Christianity. I reject that. And so many people who say they have rejected New Testament Christianity have never really examined the church of the New Testament as we read in the Bible. When preachers spend time explaining away verses of Scripture, it does, it does something to one's respect for the Bible. For example, when someone will read Acts 2 and verse 38, which is not in the notes, but I'm going to use it as an example, repent every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A denominational preacher actually quoted Acts 2.38 that way. And someone who was sitting in the audience that night said to him, Why don't you quote that verse right? It says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And the preacher pointed at him and he said, You Church of Christ member, you get out of here. <laughs> and so he knew he quoted it wrong. And yet, by quoting a scripture wrong, it can cause people, first of all, not to believe the Bible, but also to lose respect for the Word of God. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. One woman said, That's not in my Bible. And the preacher said, it is in your Bible. She says, no, it isn't. I cut it out with my scissors. <laughs> it's not in my Bible anymore. And that's what people do. They don't believe it, so they either ignore it, or they cut it out, or they pervert God's Word. Ephesians 5, 19 talks about the kind of music that we are to have in worship, say, where it says, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. And, and so they will say, well, it doesn't say not to use instrumental music in worship. Ignoring the basic principles of biblical interpretation. And so when preachers spend time explaining away verses of scripture, it does someone to one's, it does something to one's respect for the Bible. Amen. You know, in apostolic times, thousands of Christians belong to no denomination. As Christians, they were members only of the church for which Christ died, and it was universal all over the world. When one accepts Christ, there is no need to accept anything else. Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality, and power. When we obey Christ, we become Christians, that is, disciples of Christ or followers of Christ. When others do the same thing, they will be the same thing, disciples of Christ. You know, in Acts 11 26, the Bible says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And so, as Christians, we are followers or disciples of Christ. We are part of his body, as we've already noted 
tonight in our lesson. Why should any ask, what kind of Christian are you? And what do they mean by that question? What kind of Christian are you? I met a man recently. He said, I'm a Christian by baptism, and I'm a member of a particular denomination by choice. And that's the kind of attitude that some people have in regard to their religious thinking. When we obey the gospel, as they did in the first century, the same God will add us to the same church. And we will be the same thing. Simply a Christian. Nothing more and nothing less. Let's now turn our attention to the characteristics of the pre-denominational church. Number one, it has no denominational founder. We look through the history of religion since the first century, and we see a number of churches that have come into existence that had a human founder. But the only founder and the only foundation of the church that Jesus built is Jesus Himself, He said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. If a church has a human founder, that church cannot be the church that Jesus built. It cannot be the pre-denominational church. Next, this pre-denominational church has no denominational head. We've already talked about this this evening. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Colossians 1, and verse 18. And on Sunday morning during the worship, we talked about the fact that Paul used a, an example of a normal head and a normal body. You remember? Christ is the only head of his body, the church. And he has one body. One body, one head. One head, one body. Christ is the only head. And the church is his only body. Christ is the sovereign head of the church. This pre-denominational church does not recognize any human head or headquarters on the earth. You know, when you talk about headquarters, I lived in Atlanta, the Atlanta area, for 22 years. There's a lot of world headquarters in Atlanta. You know, uh, Coca-Cola, you've heard of that? Uh, headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. Maybe you've heard of Georgia Pacific. It's a tree company. Atlanta, Georgia. How about UPS, Atlanta. How about Home Depot? You heard of Home Depot? Head headquarters in Atlanta. How about Delta Airlines? Yeah, Atlanta. Well, you think about all of those multinational companies, where do you think the CEO of those companies lives? In Atlanta. That's where they live. Because wherever the, wherever the headquarters is, that's where the CEO is. Now, when we talk about the fact that Christ is the only head of the church, where is Christ right now? He is in heaven. And so the headquarters of the church that Jesus built is in heaven. And there are no earthly headquarters. There is no earthly headquarter for the church that Jesus built. Yes, sir. Further, it has no denominational creed. We have no human creed, but that does not mean that we have no creed because the word creed means, I believe. Therefore, one creed is simply what he believes. And we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he is our confession. Again, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. That's the confession that Peter made uh, when they were in the regions of Caesarea Philippi. 
And the question that Philip asked the eunuch in Acts 8 and verse 37, and the eunuch answered the question, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is the one universal pre-denominational creed, that article of faith essential to salvation. Can we not believe in the deity of Christ and go to heaven? John 8, 24, Jesus in his own words said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, see the word he up there, it, I, it's in italics. That means the word he was not in the original language. And so when we read it that way, for if you do not believe that I am, and that's of course one of the names for God, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. We must believe in the deity of Christ in order to be saved. Hebrews 11, 6, I think this is the second verse of the Bible that I ever memorized. Most, most of us memorized John 3.16. That was the first one. Now, some people, they say, well, John 11.35 is the first verse I memorized. Jesus wept. You know, that's the one they picked for their first memory verse. But Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must believe in the deity of Christ. We must believe in the existence of God. Therefore, we look to no book or discipline or rule of faith or catechism. We look only to the scripture. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures are sufficient to cover every problem and answer every question necessary for salvation, for organization, and for Christian living. Human creeds are unnecessary. Second Peter 1, verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Some churches have human creeds. They have discipline. They have rule books. And when those books that have been written by men contradict what the Bible says, they choose the book written by men. And that's one of the reasons different churches exist. Because they're following a different rule book than the one God has given to us. The pre-denominational church has no denominational name. The church of the New Testament is known as the church Ephesians 3 and verse 10, made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Colossians 1 verse 24, note, I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. The church is also called the church of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus our Lord, both theirs and ours. Also in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the church. Someone may ask, why did you use the church of Christ on the sign outside your building? 
Would it be scriptural to use the name Church of God? It would be, because we just read two passages of Scripture that call the church which Jesus built and which he died for. Uh, Acts 20, 28 was another verse that mentions the Church of God. Those are scriptural Bible terms. And what we emphasize when we're talking about identifying the church that Jesus built, it must have a scriptural name. But you know, some, some things can have the right name, but not have all the char other characteristics. For example, I see a couple of people that live in the Philippines. And when I went to the Philippines in 1999, I was introduced to the jeepney. The jeepney, you know, started out as a military GI jeep, but the jeepney became very fancy uh, later on. And I'll never forget some of the jeepneys that I saw. As it came down the street, they had a great big Mercedes Benz symbol right on the front of the jeepney. Well, did that make it a Mercedes Benz? Some of the some of you that that uh, have ridden in a jeep, you can tell, tell us that that did not make it a Mercedes Benz. I have a permanent reminder of my days of riding the jeepney, that time I was in the Philippines, because on the back, when you turn down the stairs to get off the jeepney, there are some hooks for luggage, and you can hook a piece of luggage on there so that you don't have to take it inside the jeepney. And when I came down out of that jeepney, I used the railing, and one of those hooks was turned, and it cut my hand. Open, right here on the back. And I've got a, I've got a permanent scar <laughs> to remind you of that. Well, the point is, just because it had a Mercedes Benz symbol on the front, that didn't make it a Mercedes. It had the right symbol, it had the right name, but it did not have the other characteristics. Back in the 60s, people would take the Volkswagen Beetle and they'd put a Rolls Royce grill oh. on it. Remember that? Some people would do that. They put a Rolls Royce grill on it. Well, did that make it a Rolls Royce? Absolutely not. Had the right symbol, had the right grill, but it didn't have the other characteristics. And so we could use the name Church of God out in front. We could just put the church because that's a scriptural name that we read in the New Testament. But one of the reasons that we use Church of Christ is because there are denominations that exist in the world today that use the word Church of God. And so it might be confusing to some individuals to see that name, and, you know, they may think, well, that's just a, a denominational church that exists there. Uh, also, um, we use the, generally use the name Church of Christ to make it easier for people to find the church that you can read about in the New Testament. It would not be wrong to use one of these other scriptural names. It would not be wrong to have any name out in front of the church building. And in Asia, a lot of the places over there, you cannot put a name of the particular religious group up on the signboard or up on the church building because they don't allow it in certain countries. Certainly that's true in mainland China. Well, it's called the body of Christ, as we've already noted in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, and also Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. It's called the church of Christ, Matthew 16, 18, and Romans 16 and verse 16. You know, individual members are known as disciples, and Acts 11, 26 points out. When he found him, they brought him to Antioch, that's Barnabas, finding Paul, so that it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And so we see that name, Christian, in Acts 11, 26, in Acts 26 and verse 28, and in 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. In Acts 26, 28, Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. And then Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, verse 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Individual Christians, disciples, are called saints. Romans 1, verse 7, To all who are in Rome, 
beloved of God, called to be saved. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, called to be saved. Philippians 1 and verse 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi or Philippi. Most people in our country, maybe even in the world, think that in order to be a saint, you have to be dead. Because according to the Roman Catholic Church, you can't be a saint if you're alive. You have to be dead first. But look at these passages. Paul is writing to living Christians. And what does he call them? He calls them saints. The word saint means to be sanctified or set apart. And we as children of God are set apart to be holy in the sight of God. We're called brethren, both men and women. Colossians 1 and verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. In James 1 and verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I was, when I was growing up, I would hear preachers, you know, they'd tell a joke. They'd say, we're glad that, that the brethren and the cisterns are here today. And so sometimes you might think of something else when you hear the word cistern. <laughs> but, uh, but all of us are brethren, both brothers and sisters. We're called sons of God in Galatians 3 and verse 26. For you are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5 and Revelation 1 and verse 6, you also as lively stones are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So Christians are free. Again, again, people in the religious world, when they think about priests, they think about a certain religious group. How many times did people ask me when I lived in Taiwan, are you married? Yes. Oh, I didn't think priests could be married because of a misconception that they have in the religious world. But Christians are saints, and Christians are priests. A good friend of mine who passed away a number of years ago, Delbert Gold, preached up in Hubbard, Texas, before he passed away. He told me many years ago, he was the one that uh, helped me to, to preach my first sermon when I was 12 years old, because he was the preacher where I grew up in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, Delbert said one time they went into a restaurant, a couple of the preachers, and uh, the waiter came over, or waitress came over, and he said, uh, he said to the waiter, <clears throat> we're saints. <laughs> and then she came back on another occasion and said, we're priests. Well, uh, I don't know if he was trying to get a, a shock uh, out of her or try to get some kind of a shock reaction. But anyway, it might have opened the door where he could teach them the gospel of Christ. We are priests of God. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, the priests had to be Levites. And it was only Levites who could be free. But under the law of Christ, every Christian is a priest. And that means also that every Christian has both the privilege, the right, and the responsibility to come before God's throne of grace and worship Him in spirit and in truth. Yes, sir. Amen. There is no denominational organization in the church of our Lord. The church has no universal organization on this earth. No popes, no cardinals, no archbishops, no church councils, no synods, uh, nor conventions. Each local church of Christ is an independent Christian society under the authority of Christ as revealed in the New Testament. And each congregation has its plurality of elders to oversee the flock. At 1423, but when they had appointed elders, there's an S on the end of that word, when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, 
they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. In Acts 20, verse 28, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock, over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. That's one of the three words that we read in the New Testament in the Greek New Testament, describing the elders or overseers or the shepherds of the flock, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Titus 1 and verse 5. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city, as I commanded you. Because of that, there are qualifications for elders, listed in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, and Titus 1, verses 5 through 9. Now, there are some special qualifications for elders that do not apply to the members. But most of those qualifications that we read in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, apply to all the members. There are some special ones that do not. Number one, the elder, an elder has to be the husband of one wife. That means if a person is an elder, he has to be a man, number one, and he has to be married. And then he has to have believing children, according to Titus 1, verses 5 through 9. And so that also is a qualification that some people do not need to have in order to be faithful children of God. You do not have to be married to be a faithful child of God. You do not have to be married and have children in order to be a faithful child of God. And then, of course, an elder could not be a novice. He could not be a beginner. But all of us are beginners at one point in our life as a Christian. Then deacons were selected to assist the elders in material affairs. And again, there was a plurality of deacons, Philippians 1 and verse 1, with the bishops and deacons. And then you see in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 12, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let those also at first be Tested. Let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. So, the church that we're talking about, the pre denomination church, it is organized locally with elders, deacons, preachers, and members. Did Joe Gilmore ever speak on the lectureship here? He, he, he's not able to speak here. It's sure, he used to speak, I know, of the dead lectures and others. But I'll never forget, Brother Gilmore said one time, we need to let the elders el, the deacons deek, the preachers preach, and the members mem. And when we all do our own jobs as we need to, then the church will function Properly. This church that we're talking about, that we read about in the New Testament, has no denominational worship, no denominational rites, no denominational ceremonies or forms of worship, no Easter service, no Christmas service, no Pastor's Day, no Thanksgiving services, and on and on we can go. We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4 and verse 24. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. On the first day of the week, our worship consists of the Lord's Supper, Acts 20 and verse 7. Uh, also, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 31 discusses the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 talks about the collection for the saints. He, he ordered the churches of Galatia to do it. Now he's telling the churches in Corinth to do. And so it was obviously something that Paul taught by inspiration in the first century. We sing not with instrumental music, but singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. And singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3 and verse 16. Then we pray 
We are to pray without ceasing. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. And in the church, we are to have the man pray. You know, sometimes the word man in the Bible, it comes from a Greek word which means mankind. But in 1 Timothy 2 8, the word man does not come from the word mankind. It comes from the word which means the male. And so the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. Why do we have the men lead the prayers in our public worship? It's because that is the authority that we have in worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And then we have preaching. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Yes, sir. In Acts 2 and verse 42, just as the church began, says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. This church we're talking about, the pre-denominational church, has no denominational requirement for membership. We only ask people to do what the people were told to do in apostolic time. On the day of Pentecost, when the church began, the people heard the gospel preached. Peter stood up with the eleven, beginning in verse 14, and he preached to them that first gospel sermon. And then they reacted to it. When they heard what Peter said, they were cut to the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so that shows their belief in the gospel message. They were told to repent and be baptized and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Upon doing this, they were added to the church. Which church? The one church that Jesus promised to build and that he built almost 2,000 years ago. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. To what denomination did they belong? No denomination. You know, the word denomination basically means division anyway. You know, we have denominations of many. We have the, the one and the five and the, well, wait a minute, start over. We got the one and the two and the five. I don't want to leave out the two, you know. I remember the, the guy that took a $2 bill into a country store in the country somewhere, and the lady called the police on him. So she said, we don't take counterfeit money here in this store. Well, the $2 bill is real. It's not like the, the guy that was actually trying to pass counterfeit money, and he took counterfeit bill into a country store way out in the stick. And he said, do you have a change for an $18 bill? And the lady, the lady said, sure. You want three sixes or two nines? You know, so, you know. We have the denominations in money. We understand that. But in regard to religion, there are no denominations. Well, what church were they added to? They were added to the church that Jesus promised to build and built that long ago. What kind of Christians were they? They were New Testament Christians only. Denominationalism in the world today is the result of three things. Number one, blindly following other people. You know, when Paul and Silas preached to the Bereans, they did not take Paul and Silas' word for it. But they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not the things that Paul and Silas said were so. And we are not to blindly follow other people. Another reason is because a, of a disregard for Christ's authority. Christ has all authority in heaven and in earth. All power and all authority in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Denominationalism in the world today is the result of changing God's plan of teaching, work, and worship. The Church of Christ is not a denomination. It occupies no denominational position. 
Our plea for people today is to abandon the things that divide professing Christians and be with us in this pre-denominational body. That we take Christ as our only creed and the New Testament as our only guide in Christian faith and practice. Until people renounce the doctrines of men, there can be no acceptable service to God. Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Hypocrites, Jesus said. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. You can be a member of this church, the pre-denominational church. You can be a member of the church that Jesus promised to build, that he built, and is still in existence today. And the reason it's still in existence today is we've got, we have the, the guidebook. We have the road map. We have the blueprint that tells us how to be a faithful child of God. And in order to be a member of the church that Jesus built, we must believe in the deity of Christ. We must believe in the Godhead. We must determine that we're not only going to just believe a little bit, but we're going to believe with all of our heart. And then, because we believe what the New Testament says, we learn, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. What are we going to do about it? We've got to deal with mankind's greatest problem. It is a problem of sin. What do we do? The Bible tells us. Paul said in Acts 17, 30, And the times of this ignorance, God went out, or God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. But we have to repent of our sins. What does that mean? That means to change our will or change our mind in regard to sin. It means getting out of the sinning business. And then we are to use our mouth to confess our faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And once we do that, we're ready to be immersed in water so that the blood of Christ which he shed on the cross can wash away our sins. Then we rise from the watery graves of baptism. We rise to walk in the of life. And then we begin living that Christian life that we talked about, that transformed life that we talked about on Sunday night. And we deal with the problems that we face every day, the setbacks that, we, that come our way, the discouragement, because we have a king, King Jesus, and he is the king of his kingdom. And we are privileged to be citizens of that kingdom. And Christ is our head. And we are part or members of his body. And can benefit from being in Christ, in his body, where all spiritual blessings are found. And then we live one day at a time, putting the Lord first in our lives, dealing with the the temptations, the persecution, the trials, the difficulties that we face in life. But we're willing to be faithful, even if it means we have to die. Romans, uh, Revelation 2 and verse 10. And if we do that, the promise has been made that we will receive the crown of life. Tonight we talked about the church that we read about in the New Testament. We hope the lesson tonight has been informative, challenging, that it will make us think, that it will make us study some more as to what the Bible says, but also that it will encourage us to tell others about the gospel of Jesus Christ and give others the opportunity to become children of God. If we can assist you in that this evening, we're ready to do that. It may be someone's watching online, and they are interested in becoming a child of God. 
And so if they will contact us, we will be more than happy to set up a time or maybe you're living somewhere outside of the church area and we can find someone that lives in your area to come and talk to you about your condition in the sight of God. It may be you're a member of the Lord's body already. And you need to come back and be restored because you've fallen away from Christ. Whatever your need is tonight, whatever your situation, we're ready to assist in any way that we can. And we would urge you to come together we stand and sing. Have I affection to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Dost thou come all things but Jesus but lost? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood. Tell me what I were so thankful for uh, this day, another day of life that you've given us, that we can be of service to you. We have so many uh, things that we would ask of you, but we're thankful for this opportunity that we can be together as uh, fellow Christians, that we can hear more about your word, and that uh, we can strive to grow in your word and grow in service to you. We're so thankful for uh, Jesus, the fact that you're willing to send him to this earth uh, to live a life of love and service uh, and being faithful to you. As we'd always uh, look to him as that example in our life, and we, we, we would reflect his love, his joy, his faithfulness to you, and that we in turn can be a uh, that light, that shining light, uh, reflecting you and reflecting your Son in our lives uh, to those around us. 
that we would strive to be that body, that church that you would have us to be, uh, that we can reach out to those around us and be an example to them. And we put away those traditions uh, that uh, divide us. As you bless as we go from here, uh, that everything we do would be uh, pleasing to you in our lives. As we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.